All right, so we're in Luke chapter 13 this morning. Don't forget all our messages that we <clears throat> try to put on uh, Facebook and our YouTube page so you can check them out at any time. We're in Luke chapter 13. I'll be starting verse 1, and uh, let's all unite our hearts with a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to come and worship for you today in spirit and in truth. I pray that you'll just uh, let your presence be felt here today as we go through your word. And let us glean from your your word what it is you'd have us to, to hear. Uh, if anyone's here doesn't know you today, I pray the day would be the day of salvation. Uh, just uh, bless each one that come out today. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 13, starting with verse 1. There was present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered, Answering said unto them, suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem. I tell you, nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Now hold your place there because I'm going to come back to that <clears throat> here shortly. But some years ago, the late George Gallup Jr. or Sr. did a nationwide poll and discovered one of the most bewildering, bewildering paradoxes of his career. He discovered that religious interest is growing at an unprecedented rate. But so is immoral behavior. Gallup's poll revealed that there was little, quote, little difference between those who go to church and those who do not. What Gallup discovered is what many people, both inside and outside the church, deep down know in their hearts. There's really no difference between most people who go to church and most people who don't. More evidence suggests that church members have sex outside of marriage at the same rate as non-church members. Church members are just as prone to lie, steal, commit all types of sin as people who are not even affiliated with the church at all. But the question is, why is that true? There should be a marked difference between the people of God and the people who claim no association with the Lord. Why, is it, why isn't there more of a difference between the average person who goes to church and the average person who doesn't? I believe the answer can be found in one word. Repentance. You know, this is why we're so quickly called hypocrites out here in the world is that the, the world judges us by everything we do. And, you know, we can't judge them, but they can judge us. But hypocrite is the first word they throw out at you. And again, I think it's because of uh, repentance to the average person in the world. The word repent is almost a religious joke word. Whenever a cartoonist wants to depict a narrow minded religious fanatic, he'll draw a person holding up a sign with the words repent sinner. See that so often. Yet, while the world makes light of the idea of repentance, Jesus said something about the issue that should chill us to the bone. What Jesus said about repentance reveals that it's no laughing matter. When Jesus said what he said here about repentance, he isn't making a joke at all. Notice in that verse there, he says, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Now, that's a powerful statement and we need to understand what it means. It means the death of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the cross of Jesus is absolutely worthless to you if you do not repent. The death of Jesus Christ cannot cure one sin in one sinner if that sinner refuses to repent. The blood of Jesus Christ cannot cleanse one sin of one sinner if that sinner refuses to repent. The cross of Jesus Christ cannot cancel one sin of one sinner if that sinner refuses to repent. So it doesn't matter what else you do. It doesn't matter how well you do it. Jesus said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Now, without repentance you have no chance of going to heaven. Some might say, wait a minute now, I go to church, I believe in God, I'm religious, I do such and such things, they'll outline things they do. None of this matters if you do not repent of your sins. I'll give you an example. Take a $100 bill, <clears throat> a counterfeit $100 bill. If that $100 bill gets into the circulation 
it can do a lot of good. It can pay a lot of bills. It can buy a lot of food. It can buy a lot of medicine. It can even be put in a church offering plate. It can help pay the church bills and go into the mission field and spread the furtherance of the gospel and support that. But if that $100 bill stays in circulation long enough, somebody is going to get the hands of a bank teller or somebody. I always cringe when I go to the store. And if I, I very seldom pay with cash, but if I do, I'm, I'm always, I always start feeling guilty when they take that $100 bill or $20 bill and they want to put that mark on it. And I'm like, I'm, I'm going to be the sucker that got stuck with the $100 bill. And uh, <laughs> it's never happened so far. But <clears throat> once that $100 bill is, dis is discovered, what do they do with it? It's destroyed, right? It's taken out of circulation. You know, every week I come to think that there's more and more counterfeit Christians going to church. These people do a lot of good. They're religious. They may bring their Bibles to church. They may drop a dollar in the plate. But when they die, God is going to reveal to them. He's going to reveal them for their counterfeit of what they were because they never really repented. And it's going to be tragic. But according to Jesus, you say, will he really do this? Well, he said he would. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name have done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, this is Jesus talking, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Now, for some reason, it's not too popular for preachers to get up and preach about repentance. There's some preachers that will never preach about repentance. But I'm going to preach about it today. And I pray that as I pray, as I teach you and preach to you on repentance, that you reflect on your own heart, and your own life and ask yourself, has there been a time when you've repented of your sins, when you reached out to Jesus Christ in faith and, and repented of, and been saved? So this passage speaks to us about the matter of repentance, about the steps we need to take in regards to repentance. And the title of my message today is a turn in the right direction, a turn in the right direction. And the first point I have is accept the fact of repentance. You just have to accept it from one end of the Bible to the other, from Genesis to Revelation. The idea of repentance fills the pages of that book in your lap right there. The theme of repentance is is in that Bible right there 959 times in the Word of God. It is the call of the Old Testament and it's the command of the New Testament. <clears throat> and the Bible is clear that we must repent. The very, think about it. The very first sermon Jesus Christ ever preached was a sermon on repentance in Matthew 4.17. Jesus said from that time, the Word of God says, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first time Jesus sent his disciples out to preach, they echoed the Lord's message in Matthew 6, 12 and said, and they went out and preached that men should repent. In the first Christian sermon preached on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter two, verse 38, Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then later in Acts chapter 17, verse 30, Paul got up on Mars Hill in Greece and preached to a group of pagan unbelievers. And he said, and the times of the ignorance of God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So if repentance is really that important, then we need to understand really what repentance is. And in order to understand what repentance is, then it's good to understand what repentance is not. I'm, I'm convinced that repentance is not just a word that is seldom used. It's a word that's often misused and misunderstood. It's true because though repentance is composed of several elements, it cannot be equated with just any one element. So let me illustrate this by three little, little examples here. Repentance involves the conviction of sin, but it's more than the conviction of sin. So you cannot repent until you're convicted of your sins. But you can be convicted of your sins and never repent. You get where I'm going out with this? I can, say, I can tell you so many times where I've preached or I've been in services where people have sat in the pews and you see when they do the altar call and they'll stand there and they white grip it. They, their knuckles are white. They're, they're holding on. They're uncomfortable. They're miserable. They're sweating. 
they, you know, they, they know they're convicted of that sin. They, they convinced that conviction is there, but they won't repent. And they, they, uh, they'll go out of the church and never repent of their sin. So repentance involves the conviction of sin, but it's not just the conviction of sin. Repentance involves the confession of sin, but it's more than confession. The Bible tells us it's full of people who admitted they sinned, but they didn't never repent. Think about Pharaoh. He told Moses over and over again when they were going through the plagues, right? In Exodus, he would say, I have sinned. I have sinned. It's in the, in the scripture so many times he would tell Moses, I have sinned. I've sinned. I've sinned. But was that repentance? No. Think about Judas in the New Testament. One of Jesus' disciples. He betrayed Jesus. And he said to the, he said to the Pharisees after he cashed in and got his money, he said, I betrayed the innocent blood. He said that in Matthew 7, 20, 27, 4. He knew he did it. He was convicted of it, but he never repented. In fact, many people today confess not because they want to repent, but simply because they're, they're sorry for they got caught. That seems to be the, the more uh, defining factor. They're not sorry for what they did. There's no remorse. There's no regret. I tell you, a great example of repentance is when we, uh, Brian talked about 2 Samuel a little bit in the Sunday school lesson this morning. David's a good example after the things that he did that was so horrible, the horrible sins that David committed. Now, here's a man after God's own heart who had um, an affair with Bathsheba, had her husband sent out to war and killed. He had blood on his hands. And when Nathan, the prophet, confronted him in 2 Samuel, I think chapter 11 or 12, somewhere in that area, uh, confronted David. He's one of the bravest men in the Bible, by the way, the prophet Nathan, for confronting a king and basically holding a mirror up and saying, this is what you did and this is what the Lord's telling me to tell you. Um, what did David do? He could have had him killed on the spot. He could have uh, had him thrown out and, and tortured and all that. He didn't. He repented. Great example of repentance. Uh, once King Frederick II, an 18th century king of Prussia, was visiting a prison in Berlin. He was going from inmate to inmate, asking each one, trying to prove how they had been unjustly imprisoned. They all proclaimed their innocence except one. That one prisoner was sitting there quietly in one corner. And when the, uh, while the, all the rest protested their innocence as this king walked through, uh, he sits in the corner and seeing that the sitting there was obvious to everything. He was oblivious to everything else that was going on. And the king walked over to him and said, Son, why are you here? He said, Armed robbery, Your Honor. The king said, are you guilty? The prisoner said, sire, I am guilty and I deserve to be here. The king gave an order to the guard and said, release this man, release this guilty man. I don't want this man corrupting all these other innocent people. Hmm. <clears throat> the third thing we see is that repentance involves contrition over sin, but it's more than contrition. You say, what's contrition? Contrition is a good Bible word. It means to be crushed. So repentance is contrition over sin, but it's more than contrition. It means to be crushed. It carries the idea of being broken over what one has done. It means you feel remorseful about your sin. You feel sorry for your sin and still die in your sin. If you truly come to the place of repentance, you'll, you'll regret that sin. It'll bother you. You'll hate it. You'll see it as God saw it. <clears throat> and 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10 says, Now I rejoice. Not that you were made sorry, but you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you made that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So <clears throat> what this is talking about here is this. Let's say uh, someone's an alcoholic and alco say a man is an alcoholic and he goes to the bottle and drinks heavy and beats his wife. Well, he can say he's sorry and he's repentant of this all that he wants to. But if he goes back to that bottle and goes back to that same lifestyle, has he repented? No. How about one that's uh, a spouse that's uh, unfaithful on their husband or wife? They can say they're sorry, but if they go back to that lifestyle of infidelity, they're not sorry. That's not repentance. A homosexual may say they're sorry and they want to uh, repent and they come to Jesus. But if they stay in that sinful, uh, wicked lifestyle... That's not true repentance. And that's, that's, that's not repentance at all. It's not a definition of repentance at all. And people always want to throw up in, the face, in your face about, 
How Jesus, he wanted, he hung out with sinners on earth, and he did. But notice <clears throat> when he would meet with them, just like the woman at the well, what would he tell them? Go and sin no more. They were changed. When they come to meet Jesus Christ, they had repented, right? They would go back and, and not live in that lifestyle any longer. So, <clears throat> and I remember, I remind you again of what Jesus said here in our scripture today. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So we need to understand that God demands repentance of, over sin. And if we repent of our sins, we will be forgiven. And if we refuse, we will perish in our sins. As simple as that. It is your choice. It is my choice what we're going to do. Repent or die in your sins. So that's accepting the fact of repentance. Then we see that we apply the force of repentance. We apply the force of repentance. Now what does that word repent mean? The Greek word metonia, or metonia, and it literally means to change your mind. Whatever else repentance is, it is a change of mind that results in a change in one's life. Repentance means not only to be broken over your sin, but also to be broken from your sin. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't just result in remorse, which makes you far, sorry for your sin. It doesn't just re result in reformation, where you try to get away from your sin. It results in regeneration, where your heart and your mind are changed and you become a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Scripture teaches us. When you repent, you actually go through several stages. It's a, it's a, it's a process. Repentance is a process. First thing you do is you go to a holy God and you say... Finally, you admit, I'm a sinner. There's a lot of people who say that, and they'll admit that. That's the first stage, but a person has to come to the place initially where they say that, where I, I admit I'm a sinner. Uh, Romans is correct. I am a sinner. I'm guilty. Second, you come to a place where you say, not only am I a sinner, but I'm sorry for my sin. Quite frankly, many people go to the, uh, get to the second stage and admit they're sorry for the sin, and, but they're, again, they're just sorry that they got caught. They're not really sorry that they were in that sin. So they get stuck on that. But there's a third stage you got to get to for full repentance. And that's where a sinner comes to the actual place where they say, I'm willing to turn away from my sin. I'm a sinner. I'm guilty. I'm sorry. And I've got to turn away from it. There's many people who say they want to do that, but they never actually do it. In true repentance, the repentant person turns from his sin. And that's a change in their life. You can tell it. It's, it shows evidence of it. Fruit. We'll talk about that here in a minute. They make what a military, those of you that's been in the military, they make what's called an about face. They're going in one direction. They do a complete turn, a complete 180, and they turn from it. There's a town in, a, in Labrador, Canada called Wabash. Wabush. Wabush. It's one of the most isolated towns in all of Canada. It's got one road that leads straight into it. It's one cut road. And you get in there, and the only way you're going to get out of there, it takes you eight hours, six to eight hours to travel down this road. But there's one way in and one way out. <clears throat> and if you want to leave, you got to turn around and take the opposite direction back out. Well, see, every human here today and watching on this video, every human being is born in a town called Sin. And there's only one road out of it. And that road is Jesus Christ. And to get through that, to, back to that road, you've got to repent. You've got to come out of that sin. You've got to do a 180. You've got to look at that sin the way Jesus and uh, Christ looks at use that sin, which is to despise it, to hate it, to set your uh, sail the opposite direction. And then you can come out of that road and uh, go the opposite way in a different direction from your sin. But I'm absolutely convinced that many people, more than we care to admit, have never faced the sin issue in their life. Many people belong to the church. They claim to know Jesus. They want to do religious things. But they're not Christians. Most people have little hope. They put all their hope in a date. They have their hope of salvation in a prayer they prayed or in the assurance they have given by some well-meaning family member or friend. You hear that all the time. They're always looking back to when they supposedly got saved. They may be living a hellish life now, but then the family, and it never fails, when a, when a family member dies, that's a lot of times the only hope a family member has to look back on and say, well, they made that profession when they were young. And I'm not questioning that profession. What I'm saying is, let me ask you some simple questions here about yourself. For those of you that are here today, think about your salvation experience. 
Are you truly and radically different since you got saved than you were before you got saved? Do you know that you are different? And can other people see a difference in your life? Or do you just kind of blend in with the status quo out here, the, the, the rest of the folks? Think about this statement. If your religion has not changed your life on the outside, you would better change your religion. Because that's what Jesus does. Jesus changes your life. He makes you a new creature. He changes you from the inside out. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And you know, that is why the New Testament, think about this now, that's why the New Testament never tells us to hang our assurance of salvation on something that happened in the distant past. It never tells you to do that. The Bible tells us to consider what we are because what we are reveals the way we stand with the Lord. Think about it. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul said, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. That's what I'm telling you all today. To examine yourself. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. So I'm asking you today to examine yourself. Is there a difference in your life? The second scripture is 2 Peter 1.10 where he says, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. So again, never is it related to a past experience. It's always a present sense of examining yourself, making sure you're in the faith now, today. And I'll tell you what's true about a lot of church members and people in the world. They want to experience God's forgiveness, but they don't want to repent. I heard about a little boy who got dressed in his Sunday, Sunday best and uh, was getting ready to go to church. And his mama said, now don't go outside and get dirty. We're getting ready to leave to go to church here in a minute. A few minutes later, the boy comes back in. Suit's completely muddy. He's got dirt all over him from head to toe. And she says, I told you don't go out and get dirty because we're getting ready to go to church. But you did that anyway. Now we're going to be late for church because your best suit of clothes is ruined and we've got to get you cleaned up and get you dressed. And uh, he said, Mom, I'm sorry I got in the mud. She said, I ain't got time for all that. Go jump in the bathtub and get you some, we'll get you some more clothes. He says, no, I don't want to do that. She said, what do you mean you don't want to? He said, I don't want to be clean. I just want to be forgiven. That's an example of what so many people today, Christians, so-called Christian people want to come to have that experience with Jesus. They want to come and get forgiven. They want to come and, and reach out to Jesus, but want to stay in that lifestyle. Folks, that's not repentance. If you want to stay the same person you were and just have Jesus as an ally for you, a friend for you as you go through life in your sinful ways, that's not salvation. That's not repentance. That's not biblical. There's a, you know, that's where a lot of people stop with Jesus Christ. Think about it. Why is it that, why do we have so many empty pews today? Why don't people come to church? I'll tell you why, because they never truly repented. Why is it that 50% in this, I just threw 50% in there, but it's probably a whole lot greater than that. Why is it that 50% of church members not only rob God, but they actually give nothing to his church? It's because they never repented. Why is it a lot of church members tell the same jokes, live the same life as average non-church members? It's because they never repented. There are a lot of people around us, probably some in this building maybe, or some watching on this video, but they've, they've been whitewashed on the outside. We make folks see us that we look pretty on the outside, but they've never been whitewashed on the inside. The whitewashing on the inside is much more important than the outside, because if you're whitewashed on the inside, it's going to be clean on the outside, right? Most of us here can remember Eckerd, the Eckerd drugstore chain. We had one here in Danville. It's an interesting story about a man of that name. Several years back, Jack Eckerd's, he, Jack Eckerd, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And after he gave his life to the Lord, he walked into one of his 1500 Eckerd store, drugstore chains, and he saw a Playboy and Penthouse magazine on the bookshelf. Eckerd immediately fired off a memo to every manager in every store and said, take these pornographic magazines out of the stores immediately. We are no longer going to sell them. Many of his managers called and protested and said, hey, wait a minute, we're making a huge profit selling these magazines. Eckerd said, we may be, but they're not my stores and I don't want to, 
they're my stores and I want them out. Get, get rid of them. And they never were in there again. So then after that point, you could walk into any Eckerd store anywhere across America and you didn't find those on those shelves. That happened because Jack Eckerd repented of his sin. He cleared it. He cleared the, the uh, debt with, with uh, Jesus. He got, got it straightened out. So we need to examine our own lives today and determine whether or not we fully repented. That's my question to you today is, have you truly repented? Now, the third thing, we've accepted the fact of repentance. We've applied the force of repentance. Now, thirdly, we need to appropriate the fruit of repentance. Now, go back to today's text of Luke and uh, look at verse six through nine. So Jesus follows his warning about repentance by telling his listeners a parable here that's recorded in chapter uh, chapter. Uh, I'm sorry, verses six through nine. And I want to read that to you. He says, he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he to the dresser of his vineyard, behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth in the ground? And he said unto, uh, and he said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it and it bear fruit well. And if not, then after that shall cut it down. So what does parable have to do with Jesus saying, what, what does this have to do about repentance? Well, simply this, a truly repentant person will bear the fruit of repentance. Real repentance not only clears a man's head, it cleanses also a man's heart, but it also connects with the man's will. That is, it gets into the feet and hands. It's where the rubber meets the road. It's where it gets in the feet and hands and affects the way he lives his life or her life. Repentance is not only just knowing about your sin and weeping over your sin, but it's determined to do something about your sin. Repentance means you're going to turn your back on your sin and turn your face toward God. Remember, it's that about face, that military term. You're facing your sin. You start to see that sin. No realizing you're a sinner. You see that sin as uh, as deplorable as, as Jesus Christ views that sin. You turn your uh, GPS coordinates around and you go that 180 direction towards Jesus Christ. And that's the, the where you start seeing that fruit bearing. So, and I've seen this happen time and time again. You know, you see people radically transformed when they come to Jesus Christ for salvation, repent of their sins and have that new creature, that new life um, brought about in their life. You see how they are. They're not the same person. They, but then also, unfortunately, we see people who make that profession and there is no change in their life. Um, you know, and I've seen that seems like I've seen that more and more than I've seen people with uh, real repentance. These people who profess to be saved, yet they never, as Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 quotes it, they've never yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Something is uh, very wrong with a person's profession when that happens. That's not a true profession. If you're going to stay in that same lifestyle of sin, then you're wasting, you're wasting God's time. You're not really, you don't, you don't mean business with God. And that's what, uh, there was a crowd of Pharisees and Sadducees who came to John the Baptist one time trying to trick him up. And they weren't changed. They professed to be saved, but uh, they, they had a, um, they, they tried to test John the Baptist. I'm sorry. They, they come to him and uh, talking about repentance. And the fruit is the test of life. If you have an apple tree in your yard, uh, I'm sorry, I got I got sidetracked on my notes here. I can't can't see clearly. Crowd of Pharisees come to him and John the Baptist, and they said to John the Baptist, they wanted to be baptized. That's what it was. They come to him and wanted to be baptized, and he refused. He said in Matthew three eight, he said, "Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance." And I don't know about you, but I, I've I've seen at least one preacher that I know of very uh, clearly. He's told people to go back to the pews. I was we've. Was at a uh, listened to a service one time of his, and he was doing an altar call, and a, and a boy was coming down to the to the altar, and he said he pointed him out. He said, "Go back to your seat." He said, "You don't mean big. He said, "If you if you mean business with God, you ain't gonna be laughing and joking coming down through here." True repentance. I mean, if you if you're viewing yourself as a sinner, you realize if you've come to that repentance point that you know you're a sinner, you mean business with God. It shouldn't bring joy and happiness to you. You should be repentant. You should be sorrowful. You should be coming to God. Uh, truly repentant with a truly humble heart. 
Uh, and that's what these, that's what John the Baptist did to these Pharisees and Sadducees. He said, I'm not baptizing you. You don't mean business with God. The real test of a genuine repentance is fruit. Fruit is the test of life. If you have an apple tree in your yard and you watch an apple tree for a year or three years and an apple tree doesn't bear fruit, I got news for you. That apple tree's dead. It's not going to, it's not going to do anything. You might as well cut it down. Listen to what Jesus said about fruitless trees in Matthew 7, 19 and 20. He said, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is honed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits, ye shall know them. So when people say you can't judge me, don't judge me. Well, you know, OK, well, we can be fruit inspectors, right? We can we can inspect fruit. We can't be a judge. And uh, when the Lord speaks about repentance, he's talking about total repentance. Not about partial repentance. A lot of people come down the aisle of the church and make some type of decision for Christ, but it's only a half-hearted repentance. It's only a half-hearted deal they want to work out with God. They're willing to give up some things, but they're not willing to give up everything. But let me tell you this, half-hearted repentance is nothing more than wholehearted, wholehearted rebellion. Half-hearted repentance is nothing more than wholehearted rebellion. And I've given this... Uh, illustration before i heard a shoplifter who wrote an anonymous letter to a department store and the, the letter said dear sir i've just become a christian and i can't sleep at night because i feel guilty over what i took from your store so here's the hundred dollars i owe you and he signed it only with his first name and then he put a ps at the bottom and it said if i can't sleep i'll send you the rest that's half-hearted repentance right you need the whole repentance the re the fruit of repentance is salvation and a changed life Paul sums up what I'm trying to say in this whole message in Acts chapters 20, verse 21. He says, testify us both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. Repent of your sins to God. Turn by faith to Jesus Christ. Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That verse is the essence of what it takes to appropriate the fruit of repentance. We turn from our sins before God. We turn in faith to Jesus. When it happens, salvation is always a true result. So I want you to be honest with God this morning, honest with your own heart as we conclude this message. Has there been a real change in direction in your life? Are you hoping? Are you, are you just dwelling on some past profession you made at one time or other? Um, you know, repentance alone is not going to save you, but without repentance, you can't be saved. An example you know, some of us have flown, some of you have flown before. You know, when that when that uh, airplane comes in and hits the tarmac, when it hits, hits the ground, what is the first thing the pilot does? He reverses the motor, right? He turns that thing in reverse and you hear it, you can feel it, man. It jerks, his, jerks the snot out of you as he jerks that thing when you're coming down the turn, turn um, the uh, runway. And he does that because otherwise it's going to go off course. It's going to keep going. It's not going to stop. But he reverses the motor and it comes to a complete stop. And when he does, he, he goes from R to D, puts it back in drive, and that way he can go on to the taxi, to the, to the um, gate. What happens if the pilot doesn't do that? If he keeps the thing in reverse, the plane's going to start backing up and it's going to run and it's going to crash, right? So something that heavy needs uh, to reverse its course. We're all born moving as fast as we can towards hell. We're all born in sin. We're going to go to hell one way or the other. And we're moving at such a force that if something doesn't happen to reverse the engines of our life, to put us in reverse, we're going to go off that runway and crash into hell. We're going to go into hell. But it's up to us to repent. You know, if He's convicted of us of our sins, we, can, we uh, turn to Him through repentance, through faith in Jesus Christ, and repent of your sins so you don't perish in your sins. So if you need to make a turn in the right direction, the time to do it is today. The time to do it is now. What better time to do it than right here before revival in church? Because that's what it's all about is repenting of our sins, confessing our sins to Jesus, confessing our faith in him through the Lord Jesus Christ. And a wise man once said, if we put off repentance another day, we have a day more to repent of and a day less to repent in. You're not promised tomorrow, folks. I get it straightened out today. That with us as we pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. I pray that uh, everyone in here can leave with a, uh, a clear heart and mind, knowing and having assurance, knowing that they've repented, that they've turned to you through faith in Jesus Christ, and that uh, once we know that once we are forgiven, once we repent of our sins, it's, it's not remembered any longer. It's as far as the east is to the west, and we're so thankful for that. I pray that you'll just convict any lost soul in here today. 
uh, give extend a blessing to each one who uh, sees this on the internet or or, uh, or is here today. Just touch that touch that one that, that needs you the most, dear God, in Jesus' name, Amen.